Sure. Um, okay. So uh, I am uh, I'm Lena Mosley, and I want to welcome all of you to um, our Ask the Editors Roundtable. Uh, I'm one of the co-editors in chief at IO, um, along with uh, Ashley Leeds, who's also here on the call, uh, and Peter Rosendorf, one of our associate editors, is going to moderate for us today. Uh, Aisha Zarakal, who's our other associate editor, couldn't be here because she has a conflict. Um, but uh, we're all very, uh, very happy that you've decided to join us. Uh, and um, we're going to be recording this session as well. So if others are interested and uh, ask you about it, you can always point them to that recording. Ashley and I uh, did a, a session about IO about a year ago uh, in mid-October 2022 and, uh, and, and answered a range of questions then as well. And that recording is still up on our journal's website um, through Cambridge University Press. Uh, so um, I guess that means that you can check the consistency of, our, of, of what we say. Uh, but more to the point, uh, if you have some questions about our kind of general process that maybe don't get answered for you today, uh, that's also a good um, a good resource to have. Um, a few of you submitted questions beforehand for today, and so we'll t we'll we'll start perhaps with a couple of those. But we're also more than willing to uh, to take your questions more generally. Um, the easiest thing, if you have a question that you want to ask that you um that you that you haven't asked uh, beforehand, might be to message Peter Rosendorf uh, in the Zoom chat because uh, he's going to be moderating for us to keep it sort of um, to keep it doable. Um, Ashley, do you want to say anything before I say a couple words about IO? Uh, no, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for joining and for your interest in IO. Okay. Um, so, so one of the things that um, people sometimes ask about with respect to uh, to IO is is kind of what we do in a in a very general way, um, and so people have different degrees of familiarity with uh, with our journal. Uh, and so I thought I'd just say a few a few words by way of introduction about that. Uh, one thing that's that's interesting perhaps about IO is that um, we are not uh, owned by a professional association, nor are we owned by a publisher. We're kind of a, we've always been uh, a standalone entity uh, with an editorial board that is also our board of directors. Um, and that also means that our editorial board is uh, is a is a great part of um, of what we do. That is to say that our editorial board that's about 40 people uh, does um, a lot in terms of reviewing papers and helping us think about the kind of general directions that the that the journal takes. And obviously all journals have editorial boards. It's just that ours is the most awesome of all editorial boards. Um, in terms of scope, you know, IO's um, very old history is that um, the reason it's called international organization uh, is that it grew out of a desire um, on the part of academics uh, to kind of give some descriptive analysis of intergovernmental organizations. Um, at the time, these organizations, uh, many of these organizations had just been created. So IO dates back to 1948. And if you go back to the very early volumes of IO, you'll see a description of what happened uh, in the UN General Assembly, for instance. Um, and you also eventually see some very early studies um, of, um, of UN voting. Um, but a lot of what IO was doing initially was talking about how international operations uh, functioned uh, at a time when many of these um, organizations were quite were quite new. And IO is, has definitely evolved in many ways uh, since uh, since the late 1940s. And so, you know, one way in which we've evolved is we think of ourselves now uh, as focusing on, um, on on social science and on theory uh, and uh, really, you know, not simply on describing uh, what's going on in the world, right? And obviously a lot of what we do and what we publish involves empirical analyses of various sorts, uh, but we, of various sorts, but we kind of gone away from our, from our, our, from our most descriptive roots. And um, I would say that it's also the case that, you know, some of the very early origins of IO are um, around concerns with policy. Uh, and again, there, the, the current form of IO uh, includes research that often has um, very direct policy implications, might have very clear policy motivations in the design of the research. Um, but our focus is, is typically not on pieces that are entirely policy focused, right? And so we are thinking more about um, publishing the best work uh, in the broad field of international politics uh, that uh, typically, especially for our research articles, um, advances 
our theoretical knowledge, uh, and often in various ways, um, test new theoretical claims using qualitative, quantitative, formal, um, a variety of tools uh, to, uh, to do so. Uh, and so that's been, you know, a, a longer term shift in IO. But so we're thinking about um, sort of publishing the best work uh, across a range of substantive areas, um, all of which touch on international politics or on transborder phenomena. Um, one other thing maybe to say by way of introduction is um, we often sort of get questions about whether or not uh, a paper that deals quite a lot with some phenomenon that's happening Within, within a country or within a set of countries uh, is uh, international enough or cross-border enough for international organization. And I think that, um, I think our answer is, it depends a little bit. That is to say, we don't have hard and fast rules about, you know, does this meet the test of being within uh, IO scope? Um, but we are, you know, we, we do, I, I think sort of, um, want work that is not entirely domestic in its focus. That is to say that we sort of want there to be some important uh, international uh, phenomenon that's part of the dependent or independent variable you're explaining, or some, some sort of um, cross-border or transnational um, sort of process. Uh, certainly we think about work that goes beyond just thinking about international institutions and international regimes and governance. But to the extent that it's work that involves domestic phenomena, uh, making a connection uh, to the international system in some way or another uh, is, is typically an important thing to do for work that, um, that's published in international organization. Um, and of course, sometimes this is not only a, a matter of the work itself, but also a matter of the way in which one uh, frames and presents one work, one's work. Right. So, you know, I think we've probably all read papers that are really focused um, on, a, on a single phenomenon happening in a single place at a relatively bounded point in time. Sometimes those papers think about, well, of what is this a broader example and what might this tell us about broader, um, broader theories that relate to international politics. Right. And so that framing about what does this tell us more broadly uh, is very useful. Uh, especially for work that draws on, for instance, evidence from a single country about some some phenomenon. Um, Ashley, do you want to add anything on on sort of the scope part? Um, I, think, I think the only thing I, I think that was great. I think the one thing that I would add is that um, that generalizability matters, and thinking about your scope conditions matters. But there are a number of different ways to do that. One is to argue that even if something is mainly about a single country, that it's significant for our understanding of the world. So for instance, there might be some phenomena that a country like the US or China is so important for that even if your argument only applies in that place, it's, it's very important to understanding international politics in general. In other cases, it's more important to make the case that something does apply more broadly. And I would emphasize that that's true even if you're studying the United States. Often it's people who are studying the United States who are least likely to address how generalizable their conclusions are. And so that's something that we expect broadly. It is not the case that something's only important if it applies everywhere. But we often find ourselves pushing authors to identify and discuss their scope conditions for their arguments um, and think about how broadly it might apply. Great. All right, Peter, what should we do next? Well, allow me to follow on a touch on, on this question, if I could. Um, you have a wonderful opportunity here as editors, it seems to me, to make some encouraging suggestions, encouragements to, to this audience. Would you as the editor say that there are topics, there are issue areas, there are subject areas that you would like to see people submit more to the journal in? Are there areas where we are uh, well published and areas where we would like to be better published, for example? Do you have some thoughts on that, ma on that matter? Well, I mean, you know, I, I I probably said this last year as well, um, but I think that you know, as a as a more general principle, um, you know, people often look at journals uh, and what they've published recently to get a sense of the kind of work to which a journal is open, uh, and that's a reasonable thing to do, uh, and it's it's always useful, I think, to think about 
how your submission kind of is in conversation with work that the journal has published in the past. Absolutely. Um, but you know, the, 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 the problem there is that we as journal editors are, can only publish what we get, right? So that is to say that, you know, if you look at a journal and you say, oh, they don't publish work on, um, on, on the environment or they don't publish work that's very qualitative or whatever it is, uh, it might be because people have kind of decided that that journal doesn't do that. And so they don't send that work there, right? So this can kind of become a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, so I think especially if you're working in an area that is somewhat new, for instance, um, you know, don't take the fact that you haven't seen a piece like that in the journal as evidence the journal is not open to it. Um, it might instead be that, that that people have not submitted work uh, in that area to um, to to the journal. Uh, and that's a general rule. I think that's true about not only IO, but lots of other journals as well. Uh, and given the examples I just used, I want to say that we are we are very happy uh, to consider work that is more qualitative uh, in its uh, in its focus, as well as as well as work that uses other kinds of uh, methodological approaches. Um, you know, I think that we, we typically find that um, there are the kind of uh, sort of, I don't want to say old, but kind of bread and butter issues that are out there in the world uh, that we have long received submissions for um, and long published work related to. So this might include things like um, uh, various various kinds of international political economy issues or um, conflict and peacekeeping or um, international law as it relates to human rights, as well as all sorts of other um uh, substantive issues, uh, and and certainly we uh, we also get pieces that are about sort of uh, international history and state building uh, and the development of global uh, norms and identity, uh, and and we we continue to welcome that sort of work. Um, I think that you know we also typically find that things happen in the world that motivate people to work on them, uh, and often sort of, um, you know, lead journal editors to think, we really would love to see more work on this, right? And so not surprisingly, uh, you know, pieces that um, have a focus on, uh, on climate and the environment, we've done some of that, but we continue to, I think, really want to see more of that work. Uh, I think we want to see, again, we sort of welcome work that engages with um, issues related to global public health, uh, whether it's uh, in terms of governance, uh, like the WHO, or sort of other, other kinds of issues, you know, maybe kind of motivated by what's happened in the world over the uh, last few years. Uh, I think we also are um, very much uh, interested in encouraging people to think about issues related to, uh, to race and identity as they relate to international politics. Um, and then, then I would also say less in terms of um, substance and more in terms of just um, uh, who our authors are. Uh, we are we are very um, we very much want to attract submissions um, from people who are located uh, not only in uh, in North America or in Western Europe. That's great too, uh, but elsewhere in the world, right? And so I think um, you know we have interest not only in scholarship about uh, but also scholarship from uh, the global south. I, I, I second all of that. I would add also that I think right now, you know, what I hear from board members is that people think this is a moment in the world where we're thinking about international order a lot. Um, our 75th anniversary issue was about the liberal international order. I mean, this has been the bread and butter of IO for a long time. But I think now we're looking at all these challenges to territorial integrity, all these challenges to, uh, you know, concerns about um, uh, sort of great power, new new great power competition, things like that. And so I think when we think about international organization in the world, we think broadly about both big picture kinds of things like international order and also understanding. Um, the processes that go into aspects of that, like climate or health or uh, trade or sovereign debt or alliance politics or civil war. What are your thoughts about, so generally, right, with the, the, the notion is that there's some sort of cross-border flow that is of interest, but a lot of the work that we might call international organization or certainly international political economy is often primarily subnational in nature. There are still borders being crossed, but they might be internal borders of some kind. Do you have thoughts about where the, where the line is with respect to whether that's part and parcel of what we do in international organization? So I think to some extent, 
um, authors have an opportunity to tell us why something is really relevant to international politics. And obviously, if authors are seeking to publish in I.O., it's because they want to reach the people who read I.O., who are primarily an international relations kind of audience. One thing I'll note, um, in the papers that I handle, a lot of papers are about internal conflict and about civil war. And there, one of the connections is a major interest in international order is state formation and state building. And so when we think about things like rebel governance, thinking about how this connects to debates about state building um, are really important, right? When we think about um, comparative political economy, and of course my colleagues here are better at talking about this than I am, a lot of this is about the primary cleavages internationally and domestically, right? Um, and so I think to the extent that authors can make the case that this is relevant for scholars of international organization, uh, of, of international relations broadly, not just international organization, then I think we're interested. And I, I, I agree, Ashley, and, and, I, and I think this does relate back a little bit to this question of framing, right? And so um, you, know, you can, you, if you go back to papers that you see in IO published over the last several of years, um, you certainly will find some that are really thinking about these kind of broad international issues. You know, Ashley mentioned kind of what's, what's the future of the, liberal, of the liberal international order, right, is one of these themes. Um, but you'll also find papers that are about something that is largely um, a domestic phenomenon where there is, however, uh, a claim that there are some international consequences, some international causes, perhaps both of these things, right? And so this notion of, you know, people who study international politics should pay attention to this thing, which is largely domestic, I think is a way in which uh, one can one can then make the make the case. And this, you know, this relates to, to my, my sort of, you know, statement that we don't have a set of, um, you know, the editorial team talks frequently uh, about these issues of scope and, um, but it's not that we have a sort of list of hard and fast rules that we then use to uh, decide whether or not a paper is within IO scope. You know, it typically is more in the context of here's this particular paper and what do we think about how it um, how it has um, related itself to to the scope of international uh, organization. Can I add one more thing about process related to this? Um, we sometimes get emails from people saying, "Would you be interested in a paper on X?" And generally, we can't answer those kinds of emails other than say, submit it to us and we'll see. But what we can tell you is that our editorial team has been quite efficient. And so, um, so if we were to decide something was not within the scope of IO, we usually do that pretty quickly. Our average time to desk reject is about a week, I think. Um, and so if you have concerns, then, um, then I think, uh, you know, go ahead and submit your paper and we'll give you an answer pretty quickly about whether we think it fits in the scope of IO or not. Ashley, you mentioned civil conflict uh, earlier on. There was a question in, the, in, in, in some of the submissions earlier on about political violence more generally. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything to say about where that might fit in? Yeah, so I think um, I, I think that political violence is an area where there are some pieces that quite clearly fit within IO, right? Where there are very clear international uh, uh, aspects to it. I think there are cases where it's uh, where authors can make good arguments about why they fit, and then there are other cases where um, where it might be a bigger stretch to convince us that it fits in IO, and a lot of that has to do with um, to what extent we think this is about um, uh, 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 sort of the normal domestic politics. So for example, I think it would be harder to make the case that a study of the racial implications of police violence in the US is relevant to IO than it is to make a case about how rebel governance in rebel controlled areas affects conflict between a rebel group and a state, right? Um, so when we think about a government rebel group conflict, we're really kind of approximating conflict under anarchy, right? Um, competition among groups that leads to connections with um, broader conflict processes. 
I think that some of the work that's mostly about repression and dissent um, might be a little bit hard, uh, a, a little bit harder to make the case that that connects broadly, unless you add a transnational component. There are lots of people now talking about transnational repression and how outside actors facilitate or um, impede repression within states. Certainly that's within our scope. So we're happy to be convinced. The other thing I would say is um, when we think about political violence, a lot of work is about current political violence. And I think that fits within IO. I think some of it is about the longer term consequences of political violence, some of which does have major international components and matters a lot. When we get papers that are about sort of voting behavior in post-Civil War states, things like that, there we expect to see a stronger connection to why that would belong in an international relations journal like IO rather than in comparative politics, if that makes sense. But if people have more specific examples, I'm happy to talk about that. Following up on, on the earlier question of the sorts of uh, papers or the substantive questions you'd like to see more of, uh, perhaps. Uh, Daniel Yoon asked something related, which is, are there methodological approaches that you'd like to see more of uh, in, in, in the journal? Are there uh, things that we'd like to encourage uh, methodologically that we're not seeing uh, as much of? Any Any thoughts on that question? I mean, I don't, I don't know that I have, I certainly don't have data um, uh, at hand on this, um, but my, my sense is that we do actually get a fair range um, in terms of methodological approaches. That is that we get um, a somewhat diverse set of papers, uh, sometimes using um, sort of archival and historical analysis, sometimes using a kind of case study framework, using interviews. Um, and then we get, you know, we get papers with formal models and we get papers with various kinds of statistical analyses. So I don't, I don't know that we necessarily feel like we're, I, that we're not getting certain things that, um, that, are, that are ways in which people um, think about developing and, and testing theory, but I don't know, maybe Ashley, you might, you might disagree. So I, I think we do get a wide range of different approaches. Um, one, of, one of the questions when, I, when I'm out in the field and people are asking me, you know, uh, when they do their informal ask the IO editor, a question I often get is, do you insist on causal identification? Um, so sort of, you know, can I submit something that, that I don't think that I can make a very, very strong causal claim on? And I think our reaction is that we think there's a lot to be learned by things where we can't make absolute causal um, claims. We just ask that people be circumspect in how they, uh, in the claims they make, given the data that they have. Um, and so I think we have, we're publishing things that have, you know, really um, detailed micro data. Um, we're publishing survey experiments, we're publishing field experiments, but we're also publishing observational data. We're also publishing work done from archival data. We're publishing text analysis. We're publishing ethnography, right? Um, and so I think um, I think any work that's done really well is welcome. I do think we have some expectation of people being conscious about their methodology. And so regardless of whether it's a quantitative paper or a qualitative paper, we wanna see discussion of scope conditions. We wanna see discussion of case selection. We wanna see discussion of operationalization. We wanna see, um, we want you to be clear about what the purpose of your empirical analysis is. Um, uh, is this analysis for developing insights into theory? Is it a plausibility probe? Is it, um, uh, is it hypothesis testing? Are you trying to establish cause or are you trying to show a series of correlations that are consistent with a causal argument? Um, and so I think that's where you can help us is by making it very clear what your intentions are so that reviewers don't mistake your intentions for something that they're not and judge you inappropriately. And, and one thing I would I would add there, if it's okay, is that, you know, we we do, you know, it is it is helpful uh, in the review process to us, but also to reviewers, um, if you can be as um, 
I would say as a, as clear and transparent as possible about about the um, the methods you're using and the empirical analyses you're doing. Um, so you know, and 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 sometimes uh, there certainly are concerns about um, various kinds of confidentiality, right? And so um, you know, typically when authors are doing work involving surveys. Um, you know, it's now become it's a norm to have a, a pre-analysis plan. So if you have that, uh, typically note mention that you do have that. Uh, but of course, then doing it in a way that doesn't reveal your identity uh, is uh, is a good thing to do. Um, when people do interviews, um, you know, you we typically are promising confidentiality or an, or anonymity to interview respondents um, as part of thinking about. Um, uh, ethics involving human participants uh, in research. Um, but at the same time, there's usually a, a way in which you can be transparent about how you chose your interviewees, um, who was in your study, who wasn't, like who didn't respond, um, what kinds of questions or even the exact questions that you ask your interviewees. Um, again, sort of how you're thinking about using interview data. I'm using interviews as an example here because it's a place where I've done some work, but I think in general, sometimes um, we even more, I would say on the qualitative side, um, authors could sometimes do a better job of giving um, more information about the evidence they're using and um, and the ways in which they're using it. Now, all that being said, uh, I think it is important to also be sure that to the extent that there are there's information about your methodological approach that's going to be relevant to people who want to evaluate that approach, making sure that it makes it into the body uh, of the paper as opposed to it's buried deep in a hundred page appendix, right, is an important thing to do. That is to say that, you know, when you have um, some sort of methodological appendix included in your manuscript, uh, we share that, of course, with reviewers, but we also, you know, sort of don't expect reviewers uh, to read through uh, if it is, you know, let's say um, a very, a very long uh, discussion. And so sometimes we find that authors kind of put things, you know, they, they're, you're trying to stuff a lot into the appendix because you want to cut length. Um, but you have to make sure that you don't sort of leave out things that are really going to be core to evaluating uh, the, the, the work. Following on the methodological question, um, how theory driven do we believe the journal to be? That is, can a paper be published that is purely empirical or quantitative? Or do we or do we require and must we have real substantive theoretical innovations before a paper is, is, is acceptable for publication? So I think those are two different questions I hear. Um, uh, I, I guess uh, I subscribe to a view that it is impossible to do analysis that doesn't have any at least implicit theory behind it. And so I think one question to think about is, should our um, empirical work be theoretically driven? The other question is, does the theory have to be new, right? Um, and so I see those two as separate. Um, I think that, you know, we all know the ideal paper does everything new and perfect, right? Um, not every, I don't think we can fill IO with only papers that do every single thing perfectly. Um, and we have two different kinds of uh, submissions, research articles and research notes. Research articles are 14,000 word limit and research notes are an 8,000 word limit. In a 14,000 word research article, we expect, I think, um, uh, some combination of excellence in theory development and new empirical evidence. That doesn't mean that it has to be outstanding in both of them, but I do think that we like to see the empirical evidence to be theoretically driven um, to the extent that there's really new empirical um, innovation for old theory, that's fine, right? But we do expect some discussion of how this empirical analysis connects to theory. I think that's true also in our research notes. At 8,000 words, they're much longer than say an APSR letter of 4,000 words. So a research note for IO isn't just, I collected a new data set and here it is, right? Um, a research note is gonna show how the empirical work you're doing connects to what we think theoretically. But I think with the research note, there's less expectation that we have both new theory and new empirics. And to be clear, research notes need not be empirical. Research notes can be theoretical, 
Um, they can be based on many different kinds of empirical approaches, um, but they, they provide an opportunity to say something important to the community that you can say in 8,000 words. And we recognize that that may mean that you don't have every single um, aspect that we might expect in a research article. Does that sound right to you, Lena? Yeah, actually, I was I was you know writing down some notes for what to say, but then I would kept crossing things off because you said it all. So <laughs> what Ashley said, well done, you get an A. <laughs> Are there any other while we're on the topic um, points to make about research notes? I mean, are there particular subjects that are more amenable to that kind of treatment? Um, is there? Uh, I mean, I know you've 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 said a little bit of theory, a little bit of empirics. It's hard to do in eight thousand words. Uh, do you have any particular advice? I know, for example, that 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 on occasion we have recommended to an author that the paper be resubmitted as a note rather than as an article. Are there any sort of generalizations? When does that happen? Why does that happen? Yeah, and I, I actually. Oh, go ahead, Lena. No, go ahead, please. Okay. Um, I and we've actually had cases in both directions. We've had cases where a paper was originally submitted as an article. And the reviewers come back and say, hey, you know, this aspect is really interesting, but, you know, I'm not sold on the rest of it. So how about if they submitted a research note for this particular part that we think is really important and new? And we've offered those kinds of R&R &R, uh, of revise and resubmit invitations where we ask people to, to focus on a part and submit it as a note. Similarly, uh, we have at least one case under review now where we received a note and the feedback was, this is great, but these parts need to be developed more. And we as reviewers don't think that can be done within 8,000 words. So why don't you invite them to build this out to a full article? My own thought is that 8,000 words is more than you think it is. And in fact, is pretty close to the limits for articles at some other journal. And I think that, um, that often you can tighten your work to the point where there are contributions that you can make in a research note um, that are quite important and address really important issues. And so I encourage people to consider whether a research note format is appropriate for the kind of argument and evidence that you want to provide. Um, in terms of subject matter, I actually think, I think we most commonly get research notes with quantitative evidence but I don't think that they that that has to be the case. And certainly we are very open to research notes on many topics using many different methodologies. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I think that 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 pattern actually is not surprising because I think it can sometimes be more challenging, right, to pull together a sort of full on qualitative analysis, right, in a in a in a shorter um word limit, but certainly uh, it's not, it's, it, it's something that we are, we're very much open to. Um, you know, I would just add it, that, you know, these, the, 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 the word limits, right, uh, look different at IO, right? So, you know, we, we can, we can think of journals that have 9,000 words or 10,000 words for an article, right? It's not that much more than a research note. Um, and, you know, for, for a variety of, of reasons, some of them um, historical, um, you know, we have had a, a pretty uh, long word limit for our standard articles, right? So 14,000 words is a lot of words, right? And, and you know, I sometimes think that uh, that, can, that can sometimes um, be a problem in that it doesn't sort of force people to be as tight as they might need to be uh, in the presentation of their logic and their, and, and their evidence. And so I think sometimes what happens with that, the direction of research article to research note is sort of like, well, you can sort of get rid of some of the extraneous stuff here, right? And have a, a piece that more effectively communicates your contribution uh, at, at, at 8,000 words versus at, let's say 11,000 words. Um, and so uh, I think it's, it's you know, it's in, in I think in our minds, uh, there may not be a huge difference, right? In these two buckets, right? Which is to say, uh, you know, these are the research notes are not the 4,000 word version, right? So they're typically, they're not just a, here's a new data set paper, as Ashley was mentioning, we um, we sort of um, expect more than a, here's some data uh, kind of approach. Um, 
but they, you know, they, they often are, you know, they're, they're enough to make a substantive contribution. And, you know, we've never studied this, but I could imagine that, you know, people don't necessarily draw a big distinction uh, when they see a piece uh, on someone's CV that is 31 pages in IO versus, you know, 22 pages in IO or whatever the equivalents are once you, once you, once you typeset it. Um, and so um, in terms of, there's a question in the chat about um, what kind of guidance we give to reviewers in terms of reviewing research notes. Uh, you know, we do, uh, we, do, we do have a slightly different reviewer invitation that we use for research notes versus research articles, uh, kind of reminding the reviewers, this is a research note, uh, you know, but, but again, um, I think that some of the expectations uh, are, not, are not that different, right? So we might not be looking for sort of, you know, big, broad theoretical development, for instance, um, but we are also communicating that it doesn't necessarily, you know, it, it could be all theory, it could be all empirics, right? It doesn't have a particular format, right? So we're not uh, imposing a certain format on the pieces that we send out for review that are research notes. Yeah, I just looked at our instructions and, um, and basically we do inform people that it's a note. We point out that it has an 8,000 word maximum and we tell them that they should advance our collective knowledge, but typically within a narrower range than a research article, um, and then give a variety of examples of, of what a research note could encompass. All right, I think we're gonna move on a little bit from the research notes. Um, there was a question very early on that I feel like I should get to here, which is, um, I guess more on the on the procedural side. So let's see, which, let's do this one. Uh, is there a sense in which if you've published a lot on one topic in the past, you're less inclined to want to publish on that topic again? Or is that not really a factor in the decision in the decision making process? Let me let me let me start with the kind of the the the, the rules and then maybe we can sort of think about this more broadly. Um, so uh, like many journals, uh, we expect that things that are sent to IO are, are original. Uh, that is to say that um, it's work that has not appeared in, in, other, in other sort of peer-reviewed published, um, published formats. Um, now, how we define originality, uh, we have a, a, a bullet point in our submission guidelines where we say that we expect at least 50% of the material to be new. Um, and, uh, in, and, you know, so one could, one could sort of look at one's manuscript and think like, well, I want to make sure that I'm not, uh, that, I, that I am presenting something new here. Um, and, and what that really, I think, is getting at is that um, to the extent that authors have published on a topic already, uh, and the, the, the submission to IO is different but overlapping, uh, it's going to be very important to make clear, I think, um, either in the manuscript itself uh, or um, at, at, in, a, in, a, in some details you give at the point of submission, how this is different, right? Um, I think what we really, um, we get a bit bristly when we get a piece sent to us where there's not disclosure of some kind of overlap and then uh, we discover it. Uh, and, and so I think that's a situation you want to avoid. So I think you want to make sure that you can make a claim that there is, uh, that there is there's new material uh, in what you're submitting to IO. Uh, and uh, you want to maybe share that claim uh, at the at the point of submission. Um, there are also sort of more formal rules that come um, from publishers uh, from Cambridge University Press uh, about avoiding the recycling of text. Right. So the cutting and pasting of sort of you know language that has appeared elsewhere is 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 problematic as well. Um, and I think it's useful to think about that fifty percent kind of new content as not only about its new words or different words, but also that it's new kind of substantive uh, content. Ashley? Uh, uh, sorry, Ashley, if, if I could. Lena, that's very, very important uh, as far as originality is concerned, but my question actually was sorry. poorly phrased. I think that the, the, the questioner was asking about subject matter that's been published in the journal prior. Uh, oh, I'm so sorry. I heard it as yeah, the Yeah, no, it was my fault. Own exactly. Article. So, I so, was going to respond to that. So, yeah, okay. So go ahead. Ashley, Absolutely. you answered the correct question. I answered the wrong one. <laughs> well, this was important stuff, too. I think, um, so I, I think we handle each submission individually. I don't recall ever having a conversation where we said, this is a fantastic paper, but we've already published a lot on this important topic, so we should choose something else. Um, 
to some extent, the work of editors, we're getting 550 submissions a year, right? Um, and so, but they don't all come in the same day and we get to pick which of those to publish, right? They come in sequentially. And I think that we do pretty much make decisions on manuscripts individually. Um, I also think that, that in the end, when we make a publication decision, it's gonna be based on the quality of the work. Um, and you know, by then we've already decided that something is within the scope of IO. And so we're gonna make the decision based on the quality of the work. I do think I can imagine cases in which if we felt at the borderline, you know, like, is this something where we're gonna give an author a chance to submit another version, uh, you know, a revised version or not, it's gonna be a tough case. If it were a topic that we think our readers would be really, really excited about, then I do think there's some feeling like, okay, well, we should try hard to get uh, to give um, uh, give you know a chance to those kinds of papers. But in the end, I really think that that we make a scope decision and then we make judgments on quality. All right, <clears throat> moving on now to um, the delicate subject of the appendix. <laughs> a question the, in, in the chat from Zihan is about uh, the guidelines, which is that our appendices should not exceed 20 pages or so. How um, might an author handle a situation where a rather lengthy, lengthy appendix appears to be necessary? What uh, sort of advice can you give? Is this going to negatively affect the evaluation of the piece? Is it are you less inclined to want to accept something that's going to require large numbers of tables, graphs, and perhaps lots of Greek letters as well? Okay, let me, let me, let me, let me, I, I think I know what the question is. Let me see if I can, if I can do a better job of answering your actual question, Peter. Um, so, so I would say, first of all, um, that is a guideline. And, you know, that 20 page guideline uh, is, again, goes back to this idea of uh, what would we reasonably expect our reviewers uh, to, to engage. Uh, and, you know, again, we don't, we don't ask them, we don't require them to read anything in the appendix, but if we want to sort of think they're going to, and they're going to look at the material, then keeping it, um, you know, relatively modest, I think is a, is a good thing all around. Uh, that being said, because it's a guideline, we will sometimes have authors contact us and say, um, given the, the specific circumstances of my manuscript or my method or my data, uh, I would like to have a, a, a longer, um, you know, perhaps slightly, perhaps much uh, longer document. Uh, and, you know, to the extent that one makes a reasonable case for why um, in, the, in, in, in that situation, that's necessary. I think we're inclined to sort of like, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're reasonable people, right? And we understand that what might be important to include in an appendix might vary um, for, for many reasons. So the, I, I would say sort of like, you know, as a, as a, as a first principle, um, you know, if you really think that you need more space, uh, let us know. Uh, and, uh, and Alana uh, Matthews, our managing editor, who's also here on the call and who um, uh, really uh, keeps our ship running, uh, can, can sort of uh, it, interact with you and sort of help us kind of figure out whether that makes sense. Um, I would say that, you know, the, the other piece of that then, though, is to sort of think about, well, to the extent that you do have something that's longer, um, your expectations around how much reviewers are going to be engaging that uh, should probably uh, should probably be uh, be adjusted. You know, in terms of a kind of practical matter uh, for articles that are accepted at I.O., you know, we don't um, the appendix doesn't count against our, our page budget. Uh, you know, we don't do um, copy editing and proofreading of the of the appendix documents, right? So we have you post these things, um, but you know, it doesn't impose an extra cost on us in terms of production to have long longer uh, appendices. It's more about sort of what your what your readers uh, will be willing to engage, and it goes back a little bit then to thinking about what's important to include in the body of the manuscript uh, versus to put in um, in appendices. The, the one thing I would add is that we do have a requirement that everything that is in the appendix is referred to in the manuscript itself, either in the in the body of the manuscript or in a footnote. You, you can't have a totally separate paper in the appendix. Um, so so every uh, you know that also puts a limit on how much you can put in the appendix because you've got to refer to it. Um, 
within the body of the text. And some of this is flexible also because one of the things I would say the most common case in which a reviewer comes back and says, you know, I need to see more from the appendix would be um, uh, in experimental work. They want to see the full experimental protocol. They want to see the full survey experiment, things like that. And we recognize that can take more pages, but not require more reference in the text, right? So, um, so we're flexible about um, about you know what it is that has to go into the appendix as well. What advice do you have for an author who's written a, a, a tight piece? It's it, it 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 hits all of the points that the author wants to write. It's longer than a review note, but it's shorter than a paper. Should they add more stuff to get to the word count, Max? Well, I think this is <laughs> this is Ashley smiling. <laughs> you know, it's a it's a limit, not a requirement, yes. right? That is to say that it, your piece does not have to be thirteen thousand nine hundred and ninety nine words, um, so or seven thousand nine hundred ninety nine words, right? Um, you know, that being said, I think if we get a research note that's three thousand words, we 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 might be inclined to say, well, there's maybe not enough here uh, in terms of its uh, its contribution. Um, but, uh, and, and so, and sometimes, you know, there's a, there's a piece where we're going back to our earlier uh, exchange where we think, well, you know, it's really too bad. This is a 10,000 word piece and the author had space to do more of X and she doesn't do it, right? Um, but that being said, I, I do think that, I don't think that we sort of, I, I have not had the experience of saying, oh, this piece is only 12,000 words. Clearly it's not for IO, right? Um, so. Quick question from, from the chat. How are we at IO addressing the question of um, of AI and the potential for automated authoring of manuscripts? Yeah, um, I was I was just uh, I was going to put in the chat, um, and I will in a second, uh, a link to uh, Cambridge's guidelines about this. Right. So right now we are published by Cambridge University Press, and you know. Lots of uh, lots of journals uh, and lots of academic uh, and other publishers are thinking about what to do about uh, about AI. Uh, and so there is um, there is there is guidance for authors um, whose work appears in any Cambridge University Press published publication uh, about things like um, we expect authors to, uh, to to declare and explain uh, when they're using AI, just as we would expect them to be transparent about other features of their writing and research process. Um, you know, uh, Cambridge says in their guidelines that they do not think that AI meets the guidelines uh, or their requirements for authorship uh, because there's not, uh, there's not, there's not accountability. And so uh, we, we, uh, and again, Cambridge uh, do not allow, you know, listing uh, some kind of AI tool as, um, as a co-author in some kind of work that's published. Um, and, you know, there's also, I think there, related to that, an assumption that ultimately the authors are accountable uh, for the work that they do. Uh, and there's also related uh, a plagiarism policy that, uh, that, that is there for our journal as well as for, um, as well as for other Cambridge journals. Now, all of that, of course, uh, assumes that people are, are acting in good faith uh, and are following along with, uh, with those guidelines, uh, which you know, we, we know that un unfortunately doesn't always happen. There is a question in the submissions about review articles. Do you have any suggestions or advice or recommendations to people contemplating a review article? Perhaps you can even explain what exactly is a review article and how does it differ from a no research note or a regular article? Yeah, so so a review article is a review essay is actually what we call them is something that surveys developments within a particular area of study. Often you'll find that the, um, the ones that have been published in IO will start by listing a set of books that they're, um, a set of recent books that they're bringing together. Um, it doesn't have to be books, it can be articles or it can be a combination of books and articles. Um, but I think the idea is that we need to learn something new. This is not just a literature review. Um, it's an essay in the sense that we take what other people have said 
and make uh, and, and present a new argument based on that. Um, and I think the best way to advise people on this is to encourage you to read some of the review essays that have been in IO in the past. Um, I think I, I think we've got a number of good examples, but the bar is pretty high on these. But IO doesn't publish a whole lot of review essays. And the reason I think is that we are expecting for there to be a contribution beyond just a review of the literature. Excuse me. Um, thanks. All right, let's let's move on to a little more uh, on the procedural side of how papers are getting reviewed uh, or managed. Um, I guess it's more of a policy question. Do we do we? What are the, what what are the transparency expectations for qualitative work? And in particular, what are we doing about protecting um, uh, subjects' identities, uh, especially in the context where the work is much more qualitative? Okay, I'll take that one. Uh, so um, I was on the um, the ad hoc committee several years ago that that came up with a set of guidelines for the American Political Science Association for research ethics uh, for research involving uh, human participants. So uh, this this uh, issue of um, how to balance between transparency on the one hand uh, and the protection of, um, of interviewees' identity or the content of what they say and how to think about how that's gonna vary depending on um, who's being interviewed and about what topic is, is one with which I'm, I'm quite familiar. Um, and I would say that in general, uh, we, we certainly would not want to do anything uh, that might, uh, in danger those who have taken part in the research, whether it's the researcher or the, the, the individuals with whom the researcher has, uh, has interfaced. Um, so I think that when we are thinking about uh, transparency, uh, we are certainly not thinking about the kind of like transparency trumps all other um, objectives. Um, that being said, um, I do think that we also uh, would, like, would, would, would like to encourage um, often strongly uh, transparency in terms of the research process, right? So I think there's a difference here between being transparent about um, what one did and how one did it uh, versus being transparent about the content of what one what one found. Um, and you know, with respect to process transparency, I think that is something that we uh, we tend to have um, a view that we need we we want more of that, right? That doesn't necessarily obviously that doesn't mean uh, tell us the names of the people you interviewed, right? Because again, uh, for ethical or IRB or both kinds of reasons, you may have promised anonymity and or confidentiality to those you interviewed. But it might mean something like, um, tell us how you found these people. Uh, tell us, you know, the kinds of people you sought to interview. Tell us uh, the, the, the kinds of people who were or were not uh, willing to take part in your study because that might affect the kinds of um, responses you got. And maybe tell us, you know, the kinds of things you asked or if you were using a more semi-structured kind of setup, tell us the kinds of questions you asked. Um, and then we might, you know, begin to sort of want to think about, well, if it's a broader interview study and you're really using it more to test claims as opposed to develop theory, uh, you might tell us something about, um, you know, what are the kind of general patterns you're finding uh, in your in your interview uh, data. Uh, you could think of something, you know, similar in terms of if you're using archival materials, tell us something about the archives you used and the archive, then which materials you chose to use and Give us some confidence that your um, that your that, that what you're presenting right is a, is a is an inaccurate representation uh, of the data as opposed to you know you're sort of picking out certain things that are more consistent with um, with what you want to argue. Um, but I, I think that in the you know in the in the in the world of verification of um, findings from qu from quantitative research. Right, we sort of have a more kind of like, well, you know, here's what we have to do, and it's and it's it's more formulaic. Um, with qualitative research, though, we are sort of wanting a, again to encourage transparency, but also very very aware of the trade off then between um, transparency sometimes and preventing harm uh, to the researcher or to those involved in the research or to uh, or to third parties. So I think that we certainly realize that this is more, we, we need a more often kind of case-by-case -case approach in evaluating that, um, that work. And, and I, I will say kind of more generally that, you know, we as editors um, 
sometimes have exchanges with authors uh, who have concerns about, you know, on the one hand, they want to be transparent and they want to provide information as part of the review process to allow reviewers to more um, accurately and fairly evaluate their work. Uh, but they also, you know, are, are using sources that uh, they don't want to disclose. And so that like, like, like we can sort, sort of, I think, find ways sometimes to navigate that. I mean, and I will say, you know, even on the qua quantitative side, sometimes authors are using proprietary data where they need to explain to us that, um, you know, for, for, for reasons that relate to ownership of the data, uh, you know, we can use those data to do our verification processes internally, but we can't post every single variable, right? So we, we encounter these kinds of issues um, on a fairly regular basis. And I think we, um, we try to be flexible in working with authors on it. Some uh, more procedural questions. Um, as Ashley mentioned, the journal receives upward of 500 uh, uh, submissions a, a year. Um, what determines whether a paper goes out for review or is desk rejected? And are there particular elements to the paper that you look at first as a kind of screening process to decide whether you should consider it at all? Um, yes, we absolutely screen papers to decide whether to send them to our reviewers. We currently um, are rejecting without review about 40% of the manuscripts that are submitted. We've made the decision that either when we think the scope is not appropriate, uh, that, that the fit is not appropriate for IO, or there are other reasons to believe that it's very, very unlikely to be successful in the review process, that it is um, going to speed up the eventual publication of the paper for us to make that decision quickly. So one of the things that our editorial team does, uh, you know, I, I guess we're real people, we're not machines. Um, our job is not just to, uh, to send these to reviewers and tabulate their votes and send them back to the authors, right? Um, our job is to be uh, having uh, an ability to judge which manuscripts are likely to be most successful. And so when your manuscript comes in, one of the four members of the team reads the manuscript and decides whether it's appropriate to send out. Um, and that's usually made based on subject matter and, and methodological expertise. Sometimes there are cases where somebody has a conflict of interest um, and can't be involved, but always at least two editorial team members look at something before we, um, before we reject it without review. And the, uh, the, the circumstances under which we reject without review are as follows. I would say the first and most common is it was just submitted to the wrong journal, that, um, that it doesn't fit the scope of IO. And commonly that's because of some of the things that we talked about very early. So it could be that it's just a policy proposal, that it's here's what I think the right solution to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict is. Um, or it's, let me describe all the votes that have happened in the UN on the topic of uh, arms control. You know, something like that just isn't a fit for where our journal is. Um, we get some things that are purely domestic. So if we get something that's about, you know, how do we reduce crime in Kazakhstan? Um, that would not be a fit for IO, right? And and these are these are not far fetched examples for some of the papers that we actually do get. Um, and so so that's some portion of the forty percent that we reject. Sometimes they're closer calls on scope, and so it might take us more than a week to make that determination as two of us read it and really think about whether something um, fits IO or not. We also reject some papers without review because um, we think that they uh, don't present enough new um, to be uh, to justify uh, publication on IO. So for instance, if something says, I read this paper that was published in IO five years ago, and I think that um, they need to add an additional variable. And so here's my paper with the additional variable added. Um, I think that there would need to be a theoretical argument for why this is really important for us to understand the, the core issue at stake and not just a, if I revise the specification in this model, um, then, uh, then I get a slightly different result. Um, 
uh, as we mentioned earlier, data set papers. If you just say, I've collected this new data set and here's the data set, we're often going to say, yeah, that's not quite enough. We need to know why this is important and tell us something that it tells us about, um, about phenomena that we're interested in. Then there's the, um, the, the judgment on quality. And so sometimes we will read a paper and having had lots of experience working with IO reviewers, will identify core methodological or substantive issues that we think make it very, very unlikely that the paper will be accepted in IO. And in those cases, as I said, we think that it's kinder to you to write you a letter and explain that and have you uh, revise and move on to another journal um, than for us to, to spend the two months getting reviews. Um, so I think that would be my um, judgment of, of how we make those reject without review decisions. Lena, did you have anything you want to add on that? No, well done. Let me encourage you to submit more questions. There's one that comes uh, in the in the earlier submissions. Um, why are we not triple blind? Um, Perhaps you should explain what that, that is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That came out of nowhere, Peter. Yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> No, I mean, so so as I as I understand it, uh, you know, the argument for triple blind is that uh, not only do we worry that um, reviewers uh, might have uh, biases uh, in certain ways or others if they knew author identity, um, but also we have to worry about whether editors have biases about things. Um, and uh, and you know what's what's interesting is that there's been some, I, I, as I remember. There's been some some debate about this uh, within the profession uh, about the, the the pros and cons of going triple blind versus double blind, right? So the pro is, um, you know, only the only the managing editor uh, knows things, and therefore uh, we are completely sort of, um, you know, objective. Uh, I think the uh, the there there are some cons though. That is to say that. Um, you know, to the extent that in selecting reviewers, uh, you are trying to uh, avoid some obvious conflicts of interest um, that are not maybe the most obvious, right? It's not about someone from the same institution, for instance, uh, but it's about um, people having sort of, uh, you know, stakes in certain debates or sort of longer running um, collaborative relationships with these kinds of things, you can't do that very effectively if you're triple blind. Um, you know, it's also the case that one of the arguments I, I heard made at another journal in this context was that to the extent that editors are sort of, you know, trying to um, be mindful uh, of things like um, gender or other, um, other identity characteristics or status, uh, being triple blind actually means that editors can't intervene in a positive way, right? That is to say that to the extent that we are thinking, for instance, about um, uh, whether scholars uh, from uh, using certain approaches, but also from certain parts of the world or from certain kinds of institutions are, are being treated sort of fairly, uh, we lose the ability to do that uh, if we go if we go triple blind. Uh, so uh, I think that, I mean, the, it's, it's, there's also a kind of historical, we're not triple blind because we've never been triple blind, right? But that's not a very good answer, right? I do think it's worth thinking about the, the pros and, uh, and cons of double blind versus, versus triple blind. Ashley? Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think, I, I think that there are both um, substantive debates to be had around whether triple blind is, is um, advantageous at this point in our discipline. Um, but then also there are a lot of practical issues that you don't realize until you really get into what has to happen when a manuscript gets submitted and how much of that really requires informed judgment. Um, uh, you know, dealing with originality issues, dealing with, you know, there are all kinds of things where if we didn't have access to authorship would be a lot more difficult. Um, but I think it's something our editorial board will continue to talk about. Peter, should we um, uh, speak a little bit about um, the selection of reviewers and the editorial board as well? Uh, by all means, there is in fact a question in the chat that asks whether uh, you encourage authors to recommend reviewers. So why don't you talk a little broadly about the select the reviewer selection process? 
Yeah, yeah. So one of the things <clears throat> that's, um, that, you know, uh, Lena pointed out that our IO editorial board is different because it's more awesome than anybody else's. I, I, I can't claim any scientific evidence for that. But what I can say is that, that the IO editorial board works really hard for the journal. Um, the IO editorial board members review very frequently. And so most of our submissions at this point that we are sending out for review um, uh, will go to at least one member of the editorial board. Um, so, so when you ask about recommending reviewers, I don't think we're opposed to you recommending reviewers, as long as you keep in mind that we can't have people who already know your identity and co-authors and, um, and, and folks like that. We don't make any commitment that we'll use the reviewers that you recommend, um, but it's fine if you want to recommend reviewers. Generally, papers that are sent out for review, we first think about a board reviewer who would be appropriate, and we try to have a broad representation on our board. And then we also think about who will have the substantive and or methodological and or theoretical um, uh, expertise to give us great advice on this paper. Most of the time, re uh, papers get either two or three reviewers, there are cases in which we've had something like four reviewers, but only in cases where we really need an expert on, for instance, the, the particular empirical case and an expert on the methodology and an expert on the theory. And we really can't find people that, that duplicate those expertise. Keep in mind that the reviewer's job is to give us advice and we pick reviewers that whose advice we really respect, right? And we want a broad swath of reviewers with expertise in other areas. It is also the case, however, that the editorial team reads every manuscript. And so when your reviews come back, we don't just read the reviews. We also read the manuscript in full. We often talk about the manuscripts among ourselves. It's actually the thing that I love most about being an editor is um, Lena and I, you know, on a typical day exchange, you know, five or six emails before 8 a.m. And, um, and we spend, and all of us spend a lot of time talking about the work. Um, and so you should expect that the reviewers are reviewing this, but the editorial team is also, and we are making judgments in the end. What we try to do then is convey in a letter to you, whether it's a, a letter saying that we're ending the review process or a letter inviting a revision, um, what we think were, were core issues that really need to be taken into account either for publication elsewhere or for publication with us. If you receive an r, &R invitation from IO, we try to signal within the letter how challenging we think the r, &R is. Sometimes we'll explain, you know, we think this is really hard. We'd love to review another version if you're confident that you can um, address the issues that the reviewers and we have raised. And we try to be very clear about the issues that we think it's important for a revision to address. Did you want to say anything else about reviewers? Lena? No, I would only add somewhere in there, there was a question about, is it helpful for authors to suggest reviewers in their in their cover letter, right? And um, I think that uh, that can be helpful. Um, you know, we, and, and we certainly, when we get those suggestions as part of the manuscript submission, we certainly take those into account um, along with all kinds of other things we're thinking about. So going back to thinking about using our editorial board members, but also thinking, you know, we have data on sort of who's reviewed for us recently, right? So sometimes the suggestion, even if it's great, is not, uh, doesn't work practically. But what, but that, what that made me also want to say is that we sometimes get questions about the cover letter uh, part because it's kind of it's an option at submission and uh, and and I don't want to sort of like you know be 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 too um, dismissive but I will say that I think that you don't necessarily need to spend a lot of time on the cover letter right so that you know if you if you have something you want to share with us whether it's about you know the um, issues related to the transparency of the research design or telling us something about you know how this piece is different from your other work or um, 
you want to suggest reviewers, that's great. Um, but I think that you, one does not need to spend time on a cover letter the way one would spend time on a cover letter for a job application, that sort of thing, right? So, you know, we're, we're, we're typically sort of taking taking uh, the answers that you give us uh, in the context of the, uh, the editorial manager submission process and looking at that as well, but you don't need a long developed letter. I'd just like to add one thing about the, the recommending reviewers. Occasionally, we also get notes from authors saying, you know, here are a couple of people who I think are, could not be um, impartial reviewers. That's fine. Um, and, and we will take that into account. If you list 35 people, um, then we're going to be concerned, right? But if there's one or two people who, for good reason, you think just, you know, have an alternative argument and they just really wouldn't be appropriate reviewers, it is okay for you to tell us that. Give us a little um, data on our time to first decision and time for reviews and, and so on and so forth. Yeah. All right. Oh, go ahead. Oh, do you have it in front of you? No, I was going to talk while you were pulling up the actual numbers. Oh, no. Um, I, well, I, I think what I remember is um, that for papers that we reject without review, it's less than a week on average. Um, now, there are cases that we can make a decision on immediately because they're not about international politics, for example. Um, and there are cases that will take us a little more than a week if it's a closer call. Um, but uh, for papers that receive reviews, we were averaging over the last 12 months uh, from July 1st to June 30th of last year, of uh, this year, we were averaging 55 days with reviews. So less than two months with reviews. Our average time therefore for a decision overall was about 35 days. Um, so we're, we're operating quite efficiently. Um, and we hope, therefore, that we, we recognize that junior faculty have challenges in terms of, of uh, time frames for getting things published, and we hope that will encourage you to send your best work to I.O. Now, these are averages. Um, uh, there are cases that take longer. The cases that take longer generally have issues with getting reviews in. Um, and so if you're reviewing for I.O., what I can tell you is it's much kinder to say no than to ignore our message inviting you to review um, or to say you will review and then not do it. Um, so the, the cases in which we end up in trouble are when people agree to review and then they're 30 days late and then they're 45 days late and they keep telling us we'll get it to you next week and we keep waiting, and then eventually we have to go to another reviewer. It doesn't happen very commonly, but those are the cases where we have to say, wow, it took us four months to get those authors an answer. Um, and so we just make a plea to reviewers to recognize there's an author on the other end who's waiting to hear and, um, and do your best to accept the commitments that you can complete. And, and, and we should say again that I think that part of why we are able to have, a, I think, a pretty good time to decision is that um, people are, are are typically very good at responding to review invitations and actually doing the work, right? So, you know, we have these, we have these, 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 these troublesome, right, uh, reviewers sometimes, but they're, they're really the exception and not the, not the norm. And so I, I wanted to say on that, that, you know, we, um, as policy, uh, we don't invite uh, doctoral students to, uh, to review pieces, right? We, we our reviewers um, have finished their, uh, their doctoral training, uh, but, you know, to the extent that you are in that, you have your PhD sort of bucket, uh, and you are not maybe in our reviewer database, and you would like to be in it, maybe Alana can put a link in the, uh, in the chat to do that, right? Because, I do think that you know, as we, we don't always have everybody who's working on a specific issue in our in our network, uh, and so it's super helpful to us to um, to always be kind of trying to expand and revisit our database um, of um, of reviewers. Um, and again, you know, we are um, we're we're quite lucky in that people typically um, not all, but typically will say yes to our review requests, assuming that they have the time to. Uh, to, to do that. Uh, and there was a question in the chat about sort of, you know, how to how, how we deal with um, with with, you know, the sort of nasty um, or sort of overly harsh or, you know, not kind of phoning it in kinds of reviews. And, you know, I think that we are both um, 
happy about the fact that those are those are rare exceptions, right? That is to say that, you know, every now and then, right, you see a reviewer who um, hasn't hasn't engaged uh, very well in doing their job or um, the tone is sort of like not OK. And in those situations, we, uh, we we still look at the review, but we will typically in our communication back to the authors sort of, you know, flag that we that we that we have taken note of that. Right. And again, I think it's also in our case helpful that because we, the editorial team, are reading the manuscripts and we're not just kind of taking the word of the reviewers, uh, it gives us a better sense of being able to figure out, you know, where are there situations where um, the reviewer kind of got it wrong, right? So we will sometimes say in our letters to authors, you know, and by the way, you know, we, we, we agree with these kinds of concerns, maybe we have other concerns, but also here's a concern that's there that we actually don't think is legitimate, right? And so uh, we, we are engaging with reviews in that way as well. There are two related questions in, in the chat here about who submits to the journal. Um, can doctoral researchers submit papers? Do you, do you accept those from people who have yet to complete their PhD? And relatedly, are there, is there a, a set of scholars who are more likely to get their papers published by virtue of their seniority or their standing or their stage of career? So absolutely, doctoral researchers can submit papers. There's no, um, there's actually, I can't think of any requirement other than you be a person that, um, uh, you know, we don't, we don't take bot generated papers, I guess, but, um, but if you're a person, you can submit a paper to IO. Um, so, so everybody is welcome to submit. And I think quite a few doctoral students submit papers to IO. Um, in terms of who's likely to be published, I actually am not sure that we've collected data. D does anybody else know if we have data on rank? What I, the one thing I do know that we have data on is that co-authorship seems to be related to a higher probability of success. Unsurprisingly, it turns out sometimes two minds are better than one, right? So, um, so I think that that uh, that there is a higher rate of acceptance for co-authored papers than solo authored papers, um, but that's the only thing I can think of there. Can anybody else think of? No, other I was just going to say that um, we have lots of papers that are published from sort of early career researchers, right? Whether that is um, somebody who's still working on their PhD uh, or someone who has recently. Um, Earn their earn their degree. Uh, you know, we have a one of the awards that IO gives out um, is the Robert O. Cohen Award, which is for the best paper published in the previous year's volume uh, by somebody who is not tenured, right? Which means graduate students, assistant professors, and the um, and the equivalents in uh, in other countries. Um, and you know, and, and that committee works, right? That is to say that you know they they, they have a, a set of papers to consider each year. The number varies, right? But um, I, I'm trying. I want to say that for the 2022, it was maybe six or seven. I can't recall off the top of my head, right? But that in other years, I think it's been as many as ten, right? So, um, so you know, I, I think sometimes uh, it is people who are newer to uh, to the field uh, who have the kind of you know the the, the cutting edge, for instance, uh, empirical skills, right? Uh, or who are you know asking different questions, right? So. I think uh, it's not at all clear to me, right, that um, that age or rank or status uh, would be positively correlated, right, with um, with publication. And I, and I can tell you at least kind of like, you know, without data to back it up, we reject lots of people, um, lots of we reject lots of people given our rates of publication, but we reject that includes rejecting lots of senior people. Clara Song, my, my voice, excuse me. Clara Song asks a really tricky question. And I'm very eager to hear your answer to this one, which is how should an author decide where to send a paper? Why should we send a paper to IO as opposed to ISQ or World Politics or Rio or some other top field journal? What makes uh, a paper, particularly an I.O. paper, as opposed to another journal's paper? So I think um, uh, I think if you're asking this from an author's perspective, you know, why would an author want to submit their paper to I.O.? I think what an author should be thinking about is who is your um, preferred audience, right? What community are you trying to speak to? 
Um, you know, what's the community that's likely to build on and, um, and develop your work? Where are the conversations on the issues that you're interested in taking place? Um, and so I think ideally, what you want to think about is look at, you know, is this the company that you want to be in, right? Look at, look at what's been an IO over time. And is that the company that you want your article to share? Now, as I said, as Lena said earlier, and, and I agree with, we're not only publishing things on things we've published on in the past, but I think there are linkages to the kinds of articles that people expect to see in IO and the impact that they make. And so thinking about whether that's the kind of impact you'd like your article to have with that kind of community is one of the things that you think about in deciding where to submit. Um, I think, you know, look at, look at where the papers that you're citing were published, right? Um, if, you're, if a lot of the papers that you're citing were published in IO, if a lot of the papers that you like to read on the topic were published in IO, then certainly that's a place that that um, that might be really attractive to you. I think that we also want to expand what we do, and so we're open to expanding the conversation through those kinds of um, through those kinds of networks. The other thing I'll say is, you know, there's information out there about how quickly you get a response, how professional the the handling of your manuscript is going to be what the readership of different journals are, what the impact factors, for those of you who are new to the field, impact factors are sort of the average citations of articles within a journal. There's lots of information about that. And I can, uh, as, a, as a spoiler, IO does really well on all these things. <laughs> that historically, IO papers get a lot of attention within the community and are well-respected. Um, and so I think these are all reasons to think about IO as an appropriate outlet if your work fits the kinds of, of types of submissions that we're encouraging. Lena? Well, um, that, I mean, that, that covers a lot of it. Um, and, you know, I, I, as you're asking that question, Peter, I was thinking about the fact that, you know, with my co-authors, including you, sometimes I have this conversation about where should we send this paper? Right. So it's one of these questions that like, you know, even even as one is more advanced in one's career, it's not always clear what the what the right answer is, uh, depending on the paper. Right. But but I think it is often then, um, you know, a question about what's the right audience and what are the right conversations uh, that you want to be in. Um, the one thing I would say in, in more practical terms is that I do think that it's important to think about what the kind of stage of the of the of the manuscript in question is. So. Um, you know, all with, with all journals, you get one shot at a given journal for a given paper, right? Uh, you don't if it, if it if it doesn't do doesn't make it um, doesn't advance in the review process, then you don't get to come back for a second try once you've revised. Um, and so I think sometimes I will occasionally hear um, people say, "Well, I'm going to send this out for review to get some comments." Right, this kind of acknowledgement, right, that it's not quite ready uh, for, uh, you know, it's not quite ready for prime time. But like, I love the idea of getting some more, some more comments, and so I'm going to send it out. Um, and you know, I, I do think that the review process, um, in its in its best form, and often in its actual form, um, is a is a form of of mentorship, right? It's a form of getting feedback on your work. And I think you know, my work is certainly always improved by um, by the comments and suggestions one gets from reviewers. Um, but that being said, I think it's also probably if you're if you're going to submit to um, to a journal that it, you know that that has um, a fairly high standard for the work it publishes, you want to make sure that you've had that paper out for you know for for maybe comments. Uh, you know, if you're in graduate school from your advisors, um, if you're sort of something you've presented at a couple of conferences. Um, so I, I I would you know sort of be hesitant right about um, the kind of like I'll just go out for the comments right. You want to you want to send. Uh, your best work and, uh, you know, a, a good version of your work. Now, that being said, I think we all have to guard against um, the temptation to say, I'm not going to send something out until it's absolutely perfect, right? There's a, there's a balancing act there. Um, but I would say that in thinking about submitting one's, one's work to IO, uh, it is always useful to have gone out and got um, some comments and feedback uh, in, in one setting or another before, uh, before doing that. Um, and people who have, who have, have more experience, uh, Publishing in the field can also be really good sources of advice. Uh, you know, if you have um, 
more senior colleagues or um, mentors or advisors, uh, they can also help out with a particular paper and where uh, it might be a good fit. Yeah, and I think each of us have broad research agendas, right? And there are papers that I write that I think would be, not now, right? I can't submit to IO now, but would be appropriate for IO. There are other papers where I might think this is a step in the research project process, and I need to make this kind of normal science empirical contribution before I move on. But this isn't something that's going to be relevant for the broad range of international relations scholars. This is going to be relevant particularly to people working in this very, uh, you know, specific research area. Those are things that I might send to a journal that is, um, is aimed at that specific audience. And then save for a place like I.O., the things that I think make a broader statement that's going to be relevant, not to every scholar of I.O. I don't think there's much that's relevant to every scholar of international relations, but I think um, that that would should be of interest to a broader range of scholars. All right, I think we're, we're coming close to, to the end of our allotted slot. Let me ask the editors if there's any other topics or questions or points that they, they think we've missed or that you want to to mention before we close? I guess the last thing I'd like to say is that you're allowed to ask questions, right? Thank you all for coming and listening to this. You're allowed to ask questions here, but you're also allowed to ask questions. Now, as I said earlier, a question is not, I'm writing a paper on X, do you wanna publish it, right? You have to submit your paper for that. But if you have questions during the submission stage or anything, feel free to reach out to what is it, io at io.org or IO journal. IO journal. IO at iojournal.org. Um, that uh, and ask those questions. You know, there's so much in the curriculum, and we recognize that some people have access to editors and and um, board members and other people don't. So feel free to ask those questions when you have them. Let me reiterate that um, communication with editors is actually crucially important for authors. So not just ask questions. If there's disclosures that need to be made, if there's concerns about confidentiality, if there are issues associated with originality or novelty, write to the editors, let them know, tell them what's going on so that everything is out in the open and we can all have an, an open and clear conversation uh, uh, about the work. Um, Things that sort of come up late in the evaluation or the review process just cause uh, delay, but they also cause frustration. And so the earlier and more open we can have these conversations, uh, the better the better it is. Lena, any last thoughts? Oh, um, thank you, Peter, for, uh, for, for moderating. And thanks to all of you who have joined us. Um, you know, I would just say that, you know, one thing that we didn't mention in uh, talking about the submission and review process that I do think is important to keep in mind um, is that, uh, you know, we do have rules at IO about conflicts of interest uh, in terms of how we handle submissions. Uh, so just to kind of reassure everyone, uh, you know, we are, we are very, careful as an editorial team to sort of not touch papers that are too close to us, right? So for instance, you know, the very obvious one is I need, none of us get to see papers that are written by somebody who's at our home institution, nor do we get to see papers that are written by uh, someone who was ever one of our graduate students uh, or who's ever one of our graduate advisors, um, nor by any of our co-authors. Um, and so, you know, I, I think there's sometimes a concern that, you know, that there's there's some insiderness uh, in journals. And, you know, we, we try very hard to be sure that, um, that we are being as fair as possible. And part of the way we do that is to have these formal rules that that blind us to things that where we might possibly have a have a conflict. So I just wanted to mention that's also part of what we do. And I wanna thank you for, uh, for joining us today. And I wanna thank Alana who hasn't said anything but who's been here on the call uh, for being uh, our very fabulous uh, managing editor with uh, with whom you will interface uh, if and when you submit to, uh, to IO. Thank you. <laughs> Very good. Thank you all for joining us. And uh, we will probably be doing this periodically. So keep an eye out for the next one. And in the meantime, submit questions to us that we may respond to by email or we'll uh, have another one of these down the line. Thank you all. Thanks all. Thank you. Bye.